Uh, welcome everyone again to the Indoor Ag Science Cafe. So that this is a funded project um, by USDA, NIFA, SCRI, and um, the leading institution is Michigan State University and other universities, as you can see, Ohio State, Purdue University, University of Arizona participating. This is um, one of our main um outreach program. Um, we have been actually doing five years, I was thinking about <laughs> Roberto. <laughs> it's been a long time, but uh, oh. we will continue uh, to uh, respond to your needs, um, particularly for those who are in the CEA, Controlled Environment Agriculture, uh, Indoor Agriculture Community. So, um, so let me start, um, as usual, a little bit of scheduling. So today we have Dr. Roberto Lopez from Michigan State University talking about basics, um, temperature effects on crops grown in indoor vertical farms. And then January, we have uh, John Otto. Um, if you have been attending, you might remember John Otto one time um, uh, moderating this um, Indoor Ag Science Cafe series. And he's going to talk about his uh, PhD dissertation work. It's a, a great set of information about TIPA management by controlling environment. Um, he's now with a company PP System, but uh, I specifically invited him to give a presentation to, um, I would say, feedback what he had um, studied um, in this project um, years um, in my lab. So, so that's January 16th. Um, I'd like to have a um, little bit more um, science um, this coming semester. So that's why I invited him. And then um, there are open slots. Uh, Roberto, for example, if you are a recent student, uh, wanted to give um, sort of summary of um, solo presentation. We had a group presentation showcase in the past, but I like to have a little bit in-depth um, uh, project presentation uh, in this series this year. Okay. Um, so I have more open spaces for or open slots for that. One uh, company presentation I finally scheduled uh, today, I was hoping to have, and then finally scheduled um, Dr. Shigeharu Shimamura. Shimamura is uh, from Japan, Hanmo who's going to talk about his experience, uh, observation of VOC issues in commercial vertical farms. Um, I think it's a valuable evidence, um, kind of scary, but um, it, it could be a serious issue. So I'd like to have him um, to talk about that. All right. Um, reminder, we are building this, um, educational materials in this project, Optimia University. Um, a lot of topics, um, new lectures available now. And then, um, finally today's, um, talk, um, again, uh, Dr. Roberto Lopez. Um, he's going to talk about temperature effects on crops grown in indoor vertical farms. All right, so let me stop sharing. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Cherry, for the introduction. And uh, I guess, so my name is Roberto Lopez, and I'm an associate professor at Michigan State University. And today, we're going to talk about how temperature affects our crops that are grown in indoor vertical farms, which is quite different than growing in a greenhouse. So I thought we'd first start off and look at the environmental parameters that can be controlled and monitored um, and, and when you really start to think about this, there are quite a few, right? Especially when it comes to the aerial zone or, or the leaves. In this example, we have uh, obviously a hydroponically grown uh, lettuce crop. And uh, through the years, we've obviously talked quite a bit about light, uh, whether it's the uh, light intensity or the daily light integral, as well as the light quality, uh, light duration, uh, but not a lot of focus on air and plant temperature. Of course, then there's just CO2, uh, relative humidity, and air vol velocity. Then when it comes to the root zone, obviously there's uh, fewer uh, environmental parameters that can be controlled and monitored. But again, temperature is, is again, very important um, as we're going to learn uh, today. So of the environmental factors to consider with indoor production, um, again, as I said before, we often uh, take light 
uh, into consideration because that's obviously one of the more costly uh, inputs, right, in terms of uh, providing that photosynthetic lighting. Obviously, humidity is also of importance in CO2 concentration and uh, the airspeed within the indoor vertical facility. But oftentimes, temperature um, is not always given the, the most attention. And so why are we so concerned with temperature? Well, it affects many physiological processes, right? And it's really the, the plant temperature, right, that um, is of importance because that is what's going to ultimately lead to uh, scheduling of our crops. And it's really this temperature or transfer of heat between the plant tissue and the surrounding environment. And what ends up happening is it's going to control the rate of cell division, but most importantly, the development of both the roots and the shoots. And so that's going to lead us to you know, be able to control um, how quickly our crops develop. And unlike a greenhouse, uh, we have a lot you know, better control, right? So um, temperature also has some indirect um, effects on growth characteristics, which primarily are influenced by light. Um, but again, there's these interactions, and so we'll see um, effects on branching, on biomass accumulation, on flower number. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, it's, it's really important to monitor as well as manage the air temperature, right? Um, good thing for indoor production is that it's relatively constant compared to a greenhouse, right? You don't have that solar radiation, which is going to affect... Uh, the, the temperatures, right, within the indoor facility. Now, of course, you know, we need to consider the lights, which those are probably going to be our, our biggest um, factors, right, uh, that are going to affect our HVAC systems. So again, much, much less control in a greenhouse, um, as we can see in this uh, photograph, because even though we are able to use um, pad cooling, heating, venting in a greenhouse, it's just going to be much more challenging to keep those environmental parameters within our set points. Okay, so before we really start to see or look into the plant responses, let's just take a step back and talk about uh, the energy balance, right, that's, that's occurring within our facility. Again, um, we are, are really not going to have that solar uh, input into our plants, but again, we need to think about those lights, right, and how close our plants are to the lights is ultimately going to affect um, our overall energy balance. So, uh, the plants are also going to uh, absorb infrared radiation from their surroundings. Um, and, right, the, the plants are going to lose energy uh, through long wave radiation, convection, and even conduction, um, and some heat loss through evaporation. So, again, um, it's, it's going to be a less of an impact indoors than in a greenhouse. But, again, we, we really need to, to take a look at these uh, different ways that our plants are going to regulate their temperature. So we're going to talk about radiation, uh, convection, and, and we're not really going to focus on leaf orientation, the shape, or even the hairs on the plant, or the heat shock proteins. So with radiation, our plants are going to be able to um, have lower absorption in the near infrared range, so about 700 to 1500 nanometers. Uh, but most of that radiation is either going to be reflected or transmitted. Um, leaves do have a high absorption in the infrared, excuse me, in the far red, far infrared range from 1500 uh, to uh, 30,000 nanometers. And that's really what's going to contribute to the energy load, right? And, and how quickly that plant temperature is going to increase. So our primary sources of that radiant energy within an indoor CAA farm are going to be the lamps, right? We're not going to necessarily um, have to worry about reflectors because uh, we're not gonna be using high pressure sodium lamps. And of course that sunlight is, is not gonna be um, within our energy balance. So, um, you know, one thing that we need to consider, right, is, is our plant temperature uh, as well as our, our water temperature for growing hydroponically are gonna be quite important uh, because again, that's going to influence the rate of development. And as we can see in this photograph, Oftentimes we find that the uh, plant temperature is higher than the substrate temperature. And obviously in this photograph, it is a potted plant, but again, that water temperature is, is also gonna be very important. 
So when we talk about radiation, right, within a greenhouse, um, especially if we are using high pressure sodium lamps, that is going to affect our plant temperature because those lamps uh, are over um, 200 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, right? And so it's, they're emitting a large amount of far infrared radiation. So um, obviously increasing the plant temperature. Now, a lot of people think that LEDs don't uh, produce heat, and that's obviously not correct. They do produce heat, but it's much, much lower than high pressure sodium lamps. It's around the surface temperature of those uh, fixtures is around 86 degrees or 30 degrees Celsius. So, um, you know, we, obviously we need to take that into consideration, um, as we can see in this photograph, how close our plants are to the fixtures themselves. Okay, so now let's move on and talk about uh, conduction and convection. So when we talk about trans heat transfer uh, via conduction, it's basically going to be um, our leaves, right? And the transfer of heat to air molecules uh, in contact with, with the leaf. A little bit different than what we are seeing in, in uh, this uh, figure, where when we think about um, you know, convection in, in a sense where we have a, a pot of boiling water, right? Uh, there's transfer of heat through a fluid, right? And that's uh, caused by motion. So we can also think about that uh, in terms of a hydroponic solution, right? Where we have, again, that heat transfer from the water to the plant. And then, of course, there's also uh, conduction. So again, with going back to the plants, there's limited um, heat transfer without convective movement, right? Due to a, a very low thermal conductivity of the air. Okay, so heat is also transferred via convection, right? So when the air moves across the plant, so obviously we wanna have air movement within our indoor facility. Um, there's gonna be two types of convection. One of them is going to be free, um, where again, that heat is transferred from the leaves um, and it causes air, the air, surrounding air to warm up and expand and obviously decrease in, in density. As that happens, the buoyant warm air is going to move um, upwards and away from the plant, right? So what typically occur, occurs indoors um, with heat rising. But then there is going to be forced air, right? So that can be caused uh, mainly by fans or by airflow within our facility. So when we have speeds greater than uh, 0 0.5 meters per second, um, in terms of air exchange, uh, we're gonna see that. So a, a typical target again is between 0.5 to one meters per second. So again, that's going to help uh, cool down our plants and, and make sure that there are no um, hot spots within the indoor facility or, or areas that are, that are too cool. Okay, so in terms of temperature, we need to consider both the daytime as well as the nighttime temperature and the average daily. So during the day, um, our temperatures are going to mostly influence our photosynthetic rate as well as our transpiration rate. But at night, that temperature is going to affect dark respiration. Now, it's, as um, the most important thing that we're, we're talking about today is the rate of development. And so our plants are really good at uh, integrating or accumulating um, you know, the temperatures that they've been exposed to, and that's what ultimately affects these developmental uh, rates. And it's really the temperatures experienced in the apical meristem that our plants are most uh, gonna be responsive to, right? So it's gonna be um, changes in the meristematic tissues. So it's gonna be in the shoot tips and the leaf axles, uh, where again, those leaves as well as the flowers are going to initiate and develop because that temperature is going to affect the rate of uh, leaf unfolding or the rate uh, or the timing of flowering. So again, it's that average daily temperature. And this is the, what gives us the ability to both slow down as well as increase the rate of development towards uh, marketability, right? So if we're growing a, a crop of lettuce and we need to have a, a certain batch by a certain date, we can then adjust the temperatures to um, influence the rate of leaf unfolding as well as uh, biomass accumulation, as I'll show you in a bit. 
So that average daily temperature um, is of importance, right? Because it's going to affect the crop scheduling. So uh, parameters, like I said before, time to flower, time to unfold a new leaf, as well as other quality parameters when it comes to both flowers as well as fruits. So it's gonna affect the size of leaves, um, root growth, and even ripening of fruit. So when we look, or when we talk about uh, plant developmental rates, um, each crop is very has a very specific base temperature or minimum temperature. And um, as we can see in this um, figure, for this particular crop, we can see that the base temperature is right around maybe four, uh, four and a half degrees uh, Celsius, right? As the temperature increases above that base temperature, we reach the optimum. And this is where uh, development is at its maximum. So it's an, typically a linear increase. As we go beyond the optimum temperature, we actually start to reach the maximum temperature where the rate of development begins to slow down until again, we reach that maximum temperature where, where the plants um, are no longer developing. So again, here we can see uh, we have our base temperature in this instance, it's uh, 10 degrees um, Celsius. So probably a crop like basil uh, tends to have a much higher base temperature. And as it indicated before, as we increase all the way up to the optimum, right? We see that the leaf unfolding increases quite a bit and then begins to fall. So again, this is gonna be very different um, for, for different uh, species and even cultivars within a species. So in this instance, we have uh, an example of both a cold sensitive as well as a cold tolerant crops. So we can see that their um, base temperatures are, are quite different, right? So for the crop that's uh, a cold tolerant, it has a base temperature near uh, uh, freezing, where for the cold sensitive crop, uh, let's call this um, basil, for example, it has a much higher base temperature. So it's gonna require much warmer temperatures for it to just to begin to unfold leaves. But we can see that for both crops, their optimum temperatures are very similar um, in the mid uh, 70s, so around, let's say, 23 degrees Celsius. Now, another important thing uh, to remember is that the optimal temperature for various developmental processes can differ within a single plant. So for example, here we have both um, developmental rates of leaves and flowers. So we can see that the, the base temperature for this particular crop is, is very similar, but our optimum temperature for um, flowering is uh, you know in, in the mid 60s. Well, our uh, optimal temperature for leaf development is uh, in the upper 70s. So um, it's going to be very dependent, right, on the on the crops that you're growing. Obviously, a floriculture crop, um, you're most uh, concerned with flowers, but for a uh, leafy green, it's going to be the development and unfolding of leaves. So here are some examples um, that I'm going to show you in terms of how temperature influences um, in Let's look at basil and nufar first. So we can see that as I indicated previously, basil has a relatively high base temperature. Um, we're at seven, or excuse me, at 11 degrees Celsius. The plant is very chlorotic and has unfolded uh, very few leaves, right? As we increase that temperature, we see a linear increase up to the optimum temperature for this particular cultivar is around 29 degrees. And we see that as the temperature increases, our rate of development begins to decrease. Now let's look at red Reuben basil, where uh, this particular cultivar is, um, consumers like it because of the color, right? And so as that temperature increases, we see that the color uh, begins to decrease as well as the morphology of the crop, right? We see that there are uh, much smaller leaves at the warmer temperature, many more leaves, but they're much, much smaller than when we grow the crop at, at 23 degrees Celsius. So again, here is the, it'd be challenging growing uh, a purple leaf basil, right? Because you, consumers want that nice color, but you're gonna get lower yield 
uh, compared to when you grow it at a at a warmer temperature. Um, here's some work that we've done with uh, strawberries. And you can see that fruit um, development as well as shape and even size is influenced by temperature. So by uh, this was photograph was taken seven weeks after uh, the plants were placed under the various temperature treatments. And at the coolest temperature, um, yes, the plants have formed fruit, but it has not fully developed. Whereas we start to go uh, at temperatures greater than, um, let's say, 20 degrees uh, Celsius and nighttime temperatures greater than uh, 15. And we start to see that the size of the fruit um, begins to get smaller. And as we get to those very warm temperatures, uh, we see very small fruit, uh, not a very appealing color, and uh, yeah, overall quality begins to decrease. What about other leafy greens? So here we are looking at arugula, again, grown at a range of temperatures from 8 to 30, 30 degrees Celsius, and we see the influence on the dry mass. So we see that um, both visually and with the dry mass, that uh, at temperatures above um, let's say 20 degrees, uh, we start to see a decrease, right? But what about leaf number? So with leaf number, we actually see that uh, we level off again between 18 to 23. Um, and although we have more leaves at, let's say, 28 and even at 33, the overall quality of the crop begins to decline. So again, that's another uh, trade-off that you need to consider um, when it comes to uh, development. Let's look at kale. So with kale, um, our highest dry mass was uh, at 18 degrees Celsius. But our leaf unfolding, um, you know, was, again, started to level off. So we had the greatest number of leaves um, at 33. But again, we see that the quality of the crop at 33 uh, was not the best. And then let's focus on our most common leafy green grown indoors, and that's lettuce. So we have two cultivars here. Uh, we have Rex and we have Rusai. And we can see that the dry mass for uh, Rex is greatest at around 23 uh, to 28. And um, similarly for Rusai at uh, a temperature of 23. Now, Another important thing to see, just similar to the red Reuben um, basil, is that as those air temperatures increase, we start to see that the red leaf lettuce becomes greener. What about the leaf number? So we see that our greatest leaf number for Rex was around 23 to 28, but for Rusai, uh, it was slightly uh, lower at uh, 23 degrees. Okay, so now let's look at the fresh mass, right? That's probably the most, uh, one of the most important parameters for, for growers. And we can see that uh, we were able to then calculate here uh, the base temperature for arugula, the optimum, the and then as well as the maximum temperature. So let's look at that fresh mass gain, right? As we increase the temperature from eight to 13, we see that our fresh mass continues to increase and then starts to level off at 23 and then begin to decline. So that's for arugula. Now let's look at kale. So kale, again, very similar to arugula, right? We level off, so our optimum temperature is, is um, right around 23 degrees Celsius. And then we start to decrease and we find that our maximum temperature, again, when um, plant basically dies, right? We've stressed it, um, and here it's around 37 degrees Celsius. And then again, let's look at both Rex and Rusai for fresh mass. So increase, increase uh, for Rex, we level off in terms of fresh mass around 24.7. But for Rusai, our optimum temperature is around 26.2. And for both crops, our maximum temperature um, is around 34 degrees Celsius. So with this information now, we've been able to develop, uh, as I said before, uh, the base temperatures, optimum temperatures, and maximum temperatures. And so what I've done here is we have 
um, for lettuce, kale, uh, tomato, as well as for sweet, sweet basil, um, their base temperatures. And we've categorized these as cold sensitive um, crops, right? Because their base temperatures are um, above 46 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or eight degrees Celsius. So um, again, if we grow these crops any cooler than this, um, we're going to really slow down that rate of development. Now, if you're considering growing, let's say more cold temperate crops, these are crops that have base temperatures between 40 to 45 Fahrenheit or five to seven degrees Celsius. Rex uh, falls in uh, in that uh, temperature range as well as um, arugula. Um, so far, and at least the terms that we've done research on, we have not um, had any cold tolerant crops, right, that we typically grow uh, indoors. And those would be crops that have a base temperature lower than 39 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius. Okay, so we've talked quite a bit about temperature. How do temperature and light um, interact and influence these um, growth developmental and quality parameters, right? So um, if we're providing our crops higher light, right, even indoors, um, that higher light is going to contribute to higher air, substrate, and even plant temperatures, which our HVAC systems may not be able to handle. So let's look a little bit closer, right? Here, what we're doing is we're looking at, again, how temperature and light, in this instance, daily light integral, interact to control growth and development. So on the left, we can see the parameters that are influenced by temperature primarily, right? And then on the left, we're looking at the parameters that are primarily influenced by light. But again, there's a lot of interaction here. And so sometimes it can be challenging to determine which of those two environmental parameters are ultimately um, influencing our crop. And so that's why, you know, we need to, to obviously control and monitor each one. So here's um, some work that we've conducted, again, with our red Reuben basil, where we are looking at the interaction of both the air temperature as well as the daily light integral. So let's uh, focus here on um, 23 degrees Celsius. So we can see that as the daily light integral increases at 23, we see that the plants are actually more compact and that we have greater accumulation of, of anthocyanins, right? So um, that's a good thing in terms of, of this particular crop. But now let's look at um, what occurs when we increase the daily light integral at 35 degrees Celsius, right? We can really see that at five as well as at 15 moles. Look at how much smaller the leaves are, right? At that higher DLI, um, the plant's morphology has changed quite a bit. And when we look at the crop grown at a DLI of five and at 23 degrees Celsius, and at a DLI of 15 and 35 degrees Celsius, if uh, I wouldn't tell you, you wouldn't know that that's the same exact cultivar. So we can see how both environmental parameters are working together to influence the growth, the development, and the quality of the crop. So now let's look at, and again, here I have an example of time to flower, but um, time to unfold a leaf would be very, very similar. So for this particular crop, as we increase the temperature, so that's um, what we're looking at down here. And here we're looking at the rate of development. So the number of days to flower. Um, and we can see how that is also influenced by the daily light integral. So here's a very, very low DLI of four moles. Let's now double that um, DLI. And by doubling the DLI, even at the same temperature, we can see that the rate of development or time to flower decreases. And then um, as we increase the DLI further, we see that we have, a again, a slight um, decrease in time to flower. And again, by increasing the DLI up to 16, we don't see a very much more of a reduction. So again, here, we're seeing that um, both environmental parameters are working together. Okay, so we've talked about how temperature influences our crops. Now, how should we monitor or measure uh, temperature? Well, air temperature is, is probably a parameter that everyone measures, 
But how many of you really measure the water or media temperature or even the plant temperature within your indoor facility? Right, so air is, is easy to measure. It's the most commonly measured. Um, it's the best single indicator, but it's always it's not always the most important, right? We're most interested and concerned with the temperature of our crops because that's how we're going to be able to schedule them for uh, specific market dates. So one really important thing to note uh, when you're measuring uh, air temperature, whether it's in a greenhouse or in an indoor facility, is that the sensor should be shaded, right? And the main reason is we don't want that radiant energy from the sun or from um, our lights to influence our reading, right? And we also need that sensor to be aspirated. So we want to get a representative airflow, right, of our indoor facility so that we are not measuring stagnant air um, within that um, enclosed sensor. Another really important thing is that the sensor should be located near the crop, right? So we don't wanna be measuring the temperature um, several feet above the crop because it's not gonna be representative of our plant temperature. So there's a lot of different ways of measuring uh, temperature. Um, it's gonna be really dependent on the component in question. So here uh, we can see with this um, Easter lily crop uh, that they are measuring the temperature and the apical meristem, right? Because they want to determine um, how temperature is going to affect the development of those flower buds. Here with this poinsettia crop, again, uh, we're measuring the leaf temperature because that's going to ultimately um, influence the BRAC development. Here we are measuring the water temperature, right, of our hydroponic nutrient solution, which is ultimately going to affect uh, rooting as well as uh, leaf unfolding. Here's a soil temperature probe, another example of a soil temperature probe as well as using an IR thermometer to measure leaf temperature. So in terms of infrared radiometers, they're probably the most commonly used um, to measure plant temperature. Uh, but when selecting one, there's a, quite a few things that you should take into consideration. And obviously that is going to influence the cost because a, a good sensor is probably gonna cost you about $250. And a really great one is gonna probably cost greater than 5,000. But again, these are, are factors that you should uh, consider, right? Um, especially, I would say, the um, field of view, right? So how close do you need to be to the crop in order to get an accurate temperature? Um, is that sensor calibrated or do you have to calibrate it um, you know, every so often? Do you need to send it in? Um, what is the temperature range, right? Uh, how easy is it to use, et cetera? Okay, um, you know, there's obviously other methods uh, using a thermocouple or a thermistor, but again, these are probably gonna be used more so in scientific research than they would be in a, in a commercial facility. And obviously a, a soil temperature probe could also be used. Um, some growers will use thermal imaging cameras to again, determine what uh, the temperature is of, of various um, components within their growing facility. So is it the, um, the leaves, the roots, the water temperature, or even the temperatures of the walls, right? Is there an infiltration of, of uh, warmer or cold air uh, coming in through one of the, the walls? So these are, can be used for, for those um, purposes. And again, here's some other uh, examples of measuring uh, substrate temperature. So you can have a, a soil temperature probe that you put into, let's say, a, a rock wool cube or you can use an IR thermometer or a, uh, a meter that is going to, again, measure the water temperature. So, you know, we've talked about quite a bit about uh, plant temperature and uh, what influences it. Um, here in this example, we have obviously the air temperature is going to affect um, our plant temperature, our light intensity, from our fixtures. Um, we don't need to worry about glazing material uh, indoors, but again, the vapor pressure deficit um, is gonna have an influence because that's going to affect the rate of transpiration, um, air movement within our facility, as well as the water 
and media temperature. So in summary, um, you know, temperature is obviously an, another important tool that we can use to manipulate both the growth and development of our crops. And it's going to have a great impact on the quality of our crops, right? Um, not only is it going to affect the timing, but it's going to affect the size of our leaves. Um, it could potentially even uh, influence the size of the fruit and the shelf life. So again, um, we're going to go ahead and stop here. But if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate um, such a um, <clears throat> insight, um, basics to applications. It's amazing set of information. Thank you so much.